Well, Phil Calloway didn't know what to say when his young children asked if mommy was going to die. His wife, Ramona, has suffered horrible seizures. Hundreds of friends and relatives prayed, but Ramona's wealth eventually slipped to 90 pounds, and medical specialists tried everything, but by the fall of 1996, the seizures were occurring daily, sometimes hourly. And Phil rarely left Ramona's side. He wondered if she would make it even to her 30th birthday. One evening, when things looked utterly hopeless, Phil paced their dark backyard, then fell to his knees. He cried out, God, help me. I can't take it anymore. Please do something. Suddenly, a doctor's name came to mind, and Phil called the doctor, saw Ramona the next morning, diagnosed a rare chemical deficiency. Within a week, Ramona's seizures ended. Her eyes sparkled again. The miracle was so incredible, Phil says, God gave me back my wife. This is what desperate looks like, right, as people? Have you been desperate for help, desperate for money, desperate for direction, desperate for hope or identity? Desperate people become frantic, scared, impulsive. In fact, desperation itself can be a a dangerous thing. I like what Jack Hafer said. He said, in God's order, there is never a situation so desperate that it must grind people to powder or press a financial appeal at the cost of integrity. Or uh, Winnie, uh, Winifred Newman said, uh, vision is the world's most desperate need. There are no hopeless situations, only people who think hopelessly. Well, hopelessness does exist because we think hopelessly. It exists because if you seek only what you have and all the resources that are available to you, you can feel hopeless. But when you gaze into the vast resources of the Lord our God who loves you, who has showered His grace upon you, who has lavished His mercy upon you, you will always see a path, you'll always see a direction, you'll always have hope. You will persevere, you will endure because God is our endurance and He is our hope and He is our perseverance. Well, today is Father's Day, and this is the day we honor God, who is our Father. God is our Father, Abba, Father. And He invites you, our God, invites you into His presence that you may sit on His lap, that you may feed on His Word, that you may know His heart as He holds you close. This is our God. He wants to embrace you. He wants to heal you. He wants to empower you. He will expect from you, and He will guide you. He will give you all that you need. Fathers are to lead the home in righteousness and love of God. Fathers are to love their wives and love their children. Fathers are to love God and make Him the focus of His attention in life. Fathers are to provide and sustain, for our God does that for us. If you ask people about their father, you may get a variety of answers. Some have had great fathers. Some have not had so great a father. (laughs) And they develop what is known as a father wound. A deep hurt that rests in the heart and mind and open for the enemy to use against you. But God, our Father, heals all our wounds. What was your father like? You know, men who, who are fathers struggle with life like any other person. When it comes to children, we struggle with what to do at times. We sometimes exasperate our children, even though in Ephesians 6 we're told not to. There's a steep learning curve in being a father or a parent in any way difficult but rewarding it brings great joy and there's trials all the same our god is father we look to him for our strength and hope we look to our father for help so that we can be father we look to the holy spirit to fill us and give us wisdom what is the most needed is godly wisdom god's word and god's spirit to properly love and lead we need god who is love and who is lord as a father we're called to be desperate for god God's word is replete with wisdom for fathers. In Deuteronomy, we read this. It says, These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. The book of Proverbs begins with the father talking to his son, saying, Hear, my son, your father's instructions And do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do do not consent. A man who is a father must rely on God and his word to bring godly wisdom to the home. He must be desperate, a desperate man for God, a man who's desperate for God. So I challenge us today, stay desperate for God. Stay desperate for him. 
You know, there's a man in the New Testament whose son was demon-possessed, and there was no one to help, no cure, no hospital, no medicine. He was desperate for his son. He asked the disciples, can you help my son? They couldn't give any help. Finally, he went to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, I need some help. He inquired, and Jesus inquired about the boy, and how long has this been happening? How long has your son been going through this? And in, in Mark 9, he says, from childhood, it has often thrown him into both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. I love that statement. <laughs> it's a prayer we ought to pray every day, right? Help my unbelief. <laughs> Isn't this what the father and mothers must cry out every day? I do believe. It's my unbelief I need help with. It's interesting that when, when, the, when, the, when the father says, uh, if you could help, and, and Jesus is incredulous, like, what are you talking about? If I can help, of course I can help. <laughs> and he's incredulous when he hears that. What are you talking about? Of course we can. We can do anything because we have the Father in heaven who never denies me. That's what, the, that's what he says to Jesus. I, that's what Jesus says to this man. I have the Father who doesn't deny me. Jesus knew his Father, and the Father is always pleased with the Son. So Jesus gets the what he asked for. This man didn't know this. It takes Jesus to understand the Father. It takes Christ to stay desperate for the Father and his will. It takes Jesus to open our eyes to all that the Father is saying and calling and doing. You know, the Mar Father in Mark 9 was desperate. Are we desperate for the Father? You know, Abraham, as we've been looking at the life of Abraham, Abraham endured 25 years waiting for the promised son, his son Isaac. He is finally born when Abraham is 100 and Sarah is 90. And the child is then weaned years later, and, he's, and the child is growing up. He's getting stronger and growing. Uh, God's promise of the son has finally happened. It's exciting. God's promise of the land that his descendants will live, will live in is, is a sure thing now. If he can produce a son from a woman who is past childbearing age, he can certainly bring back a people who have yet to exist to the land that he's now living in. This son is the proof of God's almighty El Shaddai name and power. This son is like the small cloud that Elijah saw. If there's a small cloud and then he ran because he knew it was going to rain, a heavy rainstorm. He knew he was going to have his descendants. Isaac is the boy who will produce the nation and God will have a nation from Isaac. Because God is faithful and he comes through. Well, Abraham became the father of Isaac. Isaac was the proof of God's amazing grace, his steadfast truth, and his faithfulness. What was happening, though, in the heart of Abraham? As this was all taking place, the things were happening. What happens when God provides? What happens when we face success and see God's beauty? Do we sometimes begin to become less reliant on him? Hmm. We have to stay desperate for our God. Number one, God asks for the impossible. Let's look at Genesis 22. Now it came about, verse 1, well there. Now it came about that after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Terrible. What a, what a, what a statement, what a, a request. Well, one day Abraham, he Maybe he's, he sees all that he has. He sees the tents surrounding his tents, his tent. He sees all the livestock he has. He knows the peace. He knows peace for his neighbors. He sees the servants working. He knows Lot is safe, his nephew. He sees the altar that he built where he's been worshiping God. He sees the things that he owns. He sees his wife, Sarah. She's still very beautiful. She's She's a mom in her old age. And then his eyes turn to his son, his son who's about to enter adulthood, possibly a teenager. He stops and he gazes at his son Isaac. And when he looks at him, he sees his future, his legacy, and he hears the promise of God. He is content. He's satisfied. He's happy. God has truly blessed him. His son Isaac is really here. 
And as Abraham is marveling at all that he has and all that God has done in his life and the promise is coming true, God speaks, calling Abraham. And Abraham responds, here I am. I'm here. What more would God do today? What God said, though, didn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up. What God said is he's jeopardizing everything he said before about the promise. God says, take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, and sacrifice him. Isaac is, pro- is the promised son, and if he goes, there will never be a nation, and they will not live here. God spoke to Abraham, but he did not explain all those interesting questions that may arise. He didn't even, there doesn't even seem to be any questions that Abraham has, or at least it's not recorded. So God was putting Abraham in a desperate situation. Number one, sacrifice is a calling. You know, there are stories of fathers sacrificing their children. Maybe they sacrificed their children to a career, a way of life, comfort. I remember one time hearing about a story about a family. they on vacation. They go to this rest area. They stop out. They're stretching their legs. And then they get back in the car, and they realize, oh, we missed a child. <laughs> Well, they go to the nearest exit, they turn around, they finally come back, they're worried, they're scared, but the the child is there, safe. You know, that would be a very frightening thing, wouldn't it? But you know, I think that's a parable of some people, how they have just set their child aside and they've gone on to pursue their own things, job, career, and they just drive off. Would some men sacrifice their careers for their children? There are some who sacrifice their, their children for their careers. But this is different. Abraham was called to take his child and sacrifice him. What God is asking is terrible. That You know, there's an idol actually called Molech in this land that would demand you sacrifice your children to him through fire. And I imagine there's many questions that are filling Abraham, but he doesn't, or he's not asking them, or they're not there, they're not in the, the text. You know, like, where's the questions? Wouldn't you be asking questions? Wouldn't you be saying, what are you saying? Did I hear you right? You know, in Genesis 12, God spoke to Abraham and says, Go to a place that I will show you and, and, um, and leave everything and follow me and I will take you to the place. And again, there's no questions recorded, no pushback from him. He just goes and he obeys. Remember Nike used to have that uh, slogan, uh, just do it. Uh, the church has a slogan too, just obey. <laughs> you know, sacrifice is a calling, not comfort. Comfort is a desire. Love is sacrifice. When we hear God, it will require for something in your life to die, for you to give something up. You will have to identify what is more important than Him, and you have to give that up. No idols are allowed. (laughs) Examine your heart. Surrender to His will. What you are asked for is your very life. You know that? When God comes to you, He's asking for your very life. What Abraham was asked to do, we're asked to do with our very selves daily. In Matthew, Jesus told the disciples this, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? We have to die to self. We have to take ourself and say, God, I want you to be the Lord. You are in control. I want no idols. I want no other God but you, for you are the true and living God. We have to go to the foot of the cross and say, God, you are God. We're called daily to the altar because self has to die. In Romans 12, Paul called us living sacrifices A lifestyle of dying to self and living for God. A lifestyle of staying desperate for God. Because God is God. He is Lord. Number two, obedience can be a difficult journey. Let's look at verse 3 through 8. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and said, the place from, saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. 
Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took it his hand, took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Well, Abraham became the a father late in life. First he had Ishmael uh, through Hagar, and now Isaac through Sarah. And the one thing he wants his son is to, his sons to know is to know God. He has them circumcised based on the command and the word of God. He wants them to have faith as he has had faith. For Isaac, he wants him to know that through him God will produce his people, that the promise will come through Isaac. Well, you know, during the War of 1812, General Andrew Jackson marched more than 2,000 Tennessee volunteers from Nashville to New Orleans. With bravado, they fought the decisive battle of New Orleans. The fighting took its toll on Jackson's troops. Sickness, though, proved to be the deadliest and most dangerous enemy for his army. 150 soldiers became gravely ill, 56 of whom could not even stand. Well, Dr. Samuel Hogg asked the general what he wanted to do, and he says, To do, sir. You are to leave not a man on the ground. It wasn't an official code of conduct yet, but Jackson embodied the military motto, leave no man behind. Well, Andrew Jackson offered his, ordered his officers to give up their horses to those who were sick, and the general was the first to do so. He walked, uh, marched 531 miles on foot, somewhere between New Orleans and Nashville. He earned the, old, the nickname Old Hickory, and the same name under which he would campaign for president 15 years later. Well, before winning the White House, the seventh president of the United States is alleged to have fought as many as 13 duels, which explains the 37 pistols in his gun collection. Now, I'm not advocating the reintroduction of dueling, but it does reveal something about Jackson's character. Old Hickory wasn't one to shrink from a fight, especially when honor was at stake. Jackson said, I was born for the storm, and the calm does not suit me. When the sea is calm, anyone can captain the ship in that situation. But when a perfect storm threatens to capsize your marriage or drown your dreams, you must play the man. A true man doesn't sit back. He steps up and steps in. He fights the good fight even when it seems like all is lost. Are you ready for the storm? Are you ready to fight when the storm happens for your family, for your church, for God? You know, we're born for the storm when we place our faith in Christ. When we place our faith in Christ, we're born again, ready for the battle, ready to endure, ready to fight, ready to love as Christ loved, ready to serve as he served. Being ready for the storm is described, I believe, in Revelations 12, where it says this, And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when they faced death. They overcame the enemy. They were ready for the storm because they said, we will endure, we will hold on to God, we will hold on to faith because we will not shrink. We will not shrink. Number one, Abraham obeyed. Now, there's no mention of Abraham, again, questioning God. I imagine I would have been filled with many questions, (laughs) and I probably would have asked them. Now, there's no mention of him asking. He just got up early in the morning and he heads on out. There's no pushback. But we do see a subtle response toward God as we read these verses. He does obey God. He does believe God. He believes God will take care of him, even with it sounds like he's losing everything. So we look at this. You know, he, he looks at his life. He looks at his province. He realizes, if I sacrifice my son, I will lose everything, my future, this promise, even God's promise. It's like God is putting himself on the line, his word and his character. God is not just asking Abraham to take his son, his only son, to sacrifice him, but he's demonstrating that God is putting himself on the line as well. He's putting his faithfulness on the line. Will God come through? Is God capable of being unfaithful? That would go against the nature of holiness. That would be like denying himself. 
In Hebrews, we read this about Abraham and the call to sacrifice Isaac in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who, and he who had received the promise was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. It was in Isaac that God will reveal his promise of many descendants and no one else. This was God putting his promise on the line, his very word, his very character. According to Hebrews, Abraham believed God, you will simply raise him back from the dead. I believe you. That's pretty strong stuff. You know, as we read Abraham, as we read this, notice as you read this, so Abraham rose early. He saddled his donkey. I mean, we're getting all these little details, right? He's saddling his donkey. He gathers his two men. And he says, he wakes up Isaac. Hey, come on. Let's get going. We got to go. He splits the wood. I mean, why are we being told these details? And it's almost as if he's going, will you please stop me, God, with every detail? He's like, I'm putting the wood on the donkey now. I'm, I'm getting, uh, putting my son down. We're walking. Stop me. <laughs> I mean, it almost seems like that he's, that's his response. God, will you please stop me? And Abraham was desperate for God's word. Desperate for him to speak. We come to those moments where, God, I need you. I need to hear you. Are you desperate for his word? Secondly, Abraham responds in faith. You know, as, as, as he's journeying into this place, and it takes several days to get there, there's two things that Abraham does that tells me he's trusting in God. First, when Abraham sees the place that God told him about, he tells his servant to stay there. And what he says is interesting. Stay here with the donkey and I, will, and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. He says, we will return. He's trusting God. No, we will return to this place. And then when Isaac is alone with Abraham, he asks about the lamb. He says, well, what are, where's the lamb? Shouldn't we be bringing an animal to sacrifice? And, um, uh, and then Abraham responds by saying, God will provide the lamb. Now, the word for provide is the word to see. It means to see. God will see to it. That's what, when we translate that word to see, it means to provide. That's how we use, we use the word provide. God will see the lamb. God sees the lamb. God sees the burnt offering. He will take care of it. There's an interesting correlation, though, by the way, if you look at the Hebrew language between the word to see and to fear. They look alike. And so it's, there's an interesting correlation. If I see for myself, like Adam Eve, it leads to fear. But if I let God see for me, I fear God. I worship God. If I see for myself, if I take matters into my own hand, it always leads to fear. To see for yourself leads to feel fear. Because God sees for us. When you see, you will... When you see for your own self, you will go down the wrong path. You'll make the wrong decisions. You'll choose the wrong methods. You'll bring pain to your family and yourself. God is the one who sees for you because God provides. Now, when Abraham said God will provide, he was acknowledging, I cannot right now see the lamb. <laughs> but God can. This is what faith is. God can see it. Abraham never saw his descendants. He didn't need to because he knew God saw all of his descendants. Abraham didn't know the future of his son Isaac and what would happen on the, on the mountain in the land of Moriah, but he knew God saw it. There is an implicit trust we need and desire in God. As a, as a father, the greatest legacy is to bring your children to trust in God knowing he sees the future. He sees it. In Isaiah, read this, Isaiah 51. Listen to me, you who, are pure, who, you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave birth to you in pain. When he was but one, I called him. Then I, will, then I blessed him and multiplied him. Remember Abraham and the faith he had? That's in your DNA. 
Look to that. Remember that. Abraham lived a life of faith. Me, he knew God and saw that God took care of him, that God sees, God saw to it. When we stay desperate for God, that means we trust that he sees and that we do not see for ourselves. Abraham left that legacy of faith. Let us do the same. Number three, God asks for everything. Let's look at verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And again, notice the details there. He's just putting everything there. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For I know, for now I know that you fear God and since you have, been, you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, Behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for the burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the pla- name of the, that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to his, this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the, the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, My, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of your, their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to this young man and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived in Beersheba. You know, Kevin Miller said that his father used to tell him a story about Rockefeller. Uh, Kevin said that one day a minister was invited to John D. Rockefeller's mansion. As he drove up the winding long, uh, the winding drive lined with tall trees, he says, My, my, this is what the Lord might have done if he had money. (laughs) Well, as a child, Kevin understood the moral of that story. The minister who represents, of course, his belief in God is overwhelmed by Rockefeller's wealth. And not only that, he says, God himself doesn't have as much money as Rockefeller. And then, of course, he doesn't have as much power as Rockefeller. (laughs) And so Rockefeller then would be more powerful than God because money is more powerful than God. Well, as you might guess from that story like this, uh, Kevin's dad spent most of his life working really hard to make money. But then he made an interest. Something happened. Kevin and his mother were going to church, and he came to church with them, and the preacher was preaching about Jesus and the gospel. He had an altar call, and the dad came forward. He received Christ, and and God wonderfully saved him. And, you know, when he's 60 years old, he began reading his Bible. He began praying, and then he started to give and tithe. And he says, Kevin, I've started to tithe, and it's been a great adventure. Well, then he suffered a heart attack at age 70, and he laid in the hospital for five days, and then he died. Well, at the funeral home where they laid him in a casket with his navy blazer and Land's End tie, a woman had come up to Kevin and said, You don't know me, but I was in a bad situation, a bad marriage. My husband was beating me, and I needed to get out to save my life. But I didn't know what I could do to support myself. Your dad paid for me to go to junior college, get a degree so I could be a dental hygienist. He paid for the whole thing, and nobody else knew about it. Now I have a job, and I'm making it. Your dad literally saved my life. Kevin then says this. I wonder what would have been my dad's legacy if he'd kept loving money and trying to be like John D. Rockefeller. He would have died with a lot of money, but not a lot of love. Instead, he took a risk. He tried to learn how to keep his life free from the love of money. And when he died, he left behind a woman who knows every day when she cleans people's teeth that it's a miracle she's still alive. She praised God. He, he praised God. He left a legacy of that. Abraham left a legacy of faith, a life of faith that he wanted his descendants to know and live. He stayed desperate for God. Number one, Abraham did not waver. You know, as Abraham approaches the place in this land of Moriah, uh, near Jerusalem, he gathers the stones, he builds the altar. He t- can you see all these details? Like, please stop me. And then he ties up his son and he places him on the altar. He raises his hands while he's silently screaming, Can we stop now? 
and the knife is high in the air. In one second, it will kill his son. There's no mention of Isaac responding or saying anything. As the knife is high in the air, God finally speaks. Stop, Abraham. There's no need for you to do this because I have provided a ram. Abraham renames the place to God will provide, or more specifically, God will see. Abraham is the prophetic picture of God's plan of redemption. From Abraham will come the nation of Israel. From Abraham will come Judah. From Judah, David. From David, Christ. God will bring his son, the Lord Jesus. He will bring his son to this same place, to the hill set aside, and he will sacrifice his son. What Abraham was called to do was to show that one day a son will be sacrificed. Christ will shed his blood. Christ will die. Christ will take all of your sins, all of my sins. He will suffer and he will die for you and me. Christ will shed his blood. Abraham is a picture of what God will do. God saw his son dying. Abraham, through faith, gave a glimpse of what was to come. Isaac was not the qualified son to die. He was not the one capable of dying for you and me. But Christ is. But we see images of Christ in Isaac, don't we? While Isaac is being bound and put on the altar, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to who judges righteously. Here in Genesis, we see that Isaac did not fight his father. He did not speak. He did not utter threats. He, it appears he went willingly to the altar. He carried the elements of the sacrifice just as Christ carried his cross. Isaac is the picture of Christ who has come, who died and who rose. God, this time, when Christ was going to the cross, did not stop his death, but instead watched him die. Because if Christ didn't die, we certainly would. Secondly, Abraham owned nothing. You know, when God told Abraham to stop and not to kill the boy, he proved again that God is the author of our salvation, not Abraham. God would provide the sacrifice, and he has, and he did. You know, A.W. Tozer, uh, in his book, The Pursuit of God, he said this about Abraham. The old man of God lifted his head to respond to the voice and stood there on the mount, strong and pure and grand, a man marked out by the Lord for special treatment, a friend and a favorite of the Most High. Now he's a man wholly surrendered, a man utterly obedient, a man who possessed nothing. Everything he had owned before was still to enjoy, sheep, camels, herds, and goods of every sort. He had also his wife and his friends, and best of all, he had his son Isaac safe by his side. He had everything, but he possessed nothing. There is the spiritual secret. I just love that statement. He owned nothing. Everything belonged to God. He was completely content in God, regardless of what he saw around him. It was God that he, he knew. Abraham owned nothing because he had surrendered his entire life to the living God. His entire future to God. His family. He says, I give you my family. The best inheritance, the greatest gift is to surrender your entire life to God. Stay desperate for him. Let's pray. Father God, I praise your name that you are our God, that you sent your Son who did die for us, who did rise, who does love us, who gave himself for us. I'm mindful of that verse, Lord, in Romans 5 that says, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord, for the victory we have. Thank you, Father.